Okay, I will start now. So, um, all right, this, is, this will be part two. Um, and, uh, and then there will be drinks. Yes. And food. And food. <laughs> Equal proportions. <Yeah. laughs> you know that. <laughs> okay. All righty. So, but what I'm going to do in the second half, in a way, that's probably the easier problem, or, but no. Oh. Yeah, it's somewhat easier. It relates to things which many more people probably have studied. So what I'll be talking about is spot volatility now. And so, <clears throat> so uh, I'll not be estimating the jump part, but I will be basically trying to estimate the other component or the remaining component in the price dynamics that we saw. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves, well, we will go through those things. What I will cover, you will see uh, in a minute. Well. Well, not in a minute, but in the next an hour and a half or so. Okay, so what was the dynamics? So I, I, I switched now to log price uh, before it was the price. This is now just the log price. And uh, so remember the dynamics which we had for the process X, we have a drift, we have the volatility, we have the jumps. Okay, this horrible piece here, now we will just try to forget about it. So I'm not going to... Uh, talk about its notation and stuff, uh, and instead we will focus basically on the on the stochastic volatility. Okay, stochastic volatility. The nice thing also about the volatility, and which makes it also very directly a, a way easier to test what what I'm going to do is actually kind of good or uh, well done, is that that sigma should be the same. Uh, under P or under Q. And so if I recover it correctly from the option data, that should actually compare with what I can see returns and actual volatility of, uh, of returns, okay? And so my goal will be basically the non-parametric recovery of uh, the non-parametric recovery of the spot volatility from the options. Now, how is that different from Black Scholes? I mean, if you do think about Black Scholes implied volatility, that, that's basically what the goal of uh, the Black Scholes implied volatility calculation was, right? I mean, you, you have an option pricing model and you try to invert back from the option price the volatility, okay? The only thing is that the Black Scholes implied vol is basically is derived under a model, which we know doesn't work, meaning that the volatility varies over time. And so what I will do basically is we will take advantage now of short datedness of the options and try to recover from these options basically uh, the spot volatility. Okay. That, that's essentially is the goal and then you can do many things with this and I will show you um, uh, some of these applications. Okay. So what's the idea? Very similar motivation as before. So if time to maturity is short, uh, then you can pretend basically that the volatility stays constant, that the, the, this, uh, the drift term doesn't change, and then the, the, the measure here is constant. In other words, doesn't depend on time. It's the same jump measure, okay? So in other words, the model is appro approximately what we call levy, and these three terms here, the A, the sigma, and the nu, uniquely identify uh, its law. And again, I'm interested, I'm interested in sigma. Again, I'll be using out of the money options. So it's uh, for symmetry. I put also <laughs> the notation here. That's the option price as for uh, puts and calls. Okay. Okay. And so now we start thinking basically how can we extract from the options information about the spot volatility? First thing, actually, to realize, um, which was, in a way, it was al already true in the previous presentation, but I didn't highlight it, but for what we are going to do now, it's relevant, is that uh, how this option prices decay as time to maturity goes down to zero. Okay, and so, so I'll just spend a little bit of time to discuss this because this will be related to how we extract volatility. So if your option price, if you're looking at at the money option price, okay, or option with a strike very close to the money, in an asymptotic sense, you can be very formal here, 
basically and say how how close that is but okay but just think about it if you're looking at at the money option price for simplicity then the way option price decays as time to maturity goes down to zero is actually square root of t t is the time to maturity and the way the option if you are in the tails if you are away from the money if you're looking at out of the one deep out of the one it puts these option prices actually decay uh, much faster they decay at t right remember even though this is uh, this capital T here is the time to maturity and that thing is going down to zero. And so if this number is very close to zero, when you take the square root of it, it's much bigger than the, than the T. So, you know, so the option surface or the option as a function of the strike, it's all kind of going down to zero, but it's not doing it in a uniform way. It's actually rather uneven and kind of complicated uh, way. Okay, so then if I, now the first thing which we can try to do is basically say, okay, well, let's specialize the problem or restrict the problem and say, you can only use one option to extract information about the spot volatility. Basically option with one strike. So I just tie my hands and say, I will use only one strike uh, to extract the volatility. So which one do you think that would be? Which strike would you pick? Where do you think is the strongest signal about the spot volatility? This is like a, <laughs> like a classic. <laughs> no, no, any guess? <laughs> any guess which strike? <laughs> this one special strike, right? Or add the money, right? <laughs> so, why? Because basically add the money is like you are, th that option is very sensitive to even small perturbations in the stock price you can get you in or out of the money. So it's kind of very sensitive to even small movements in the stock price. And, uh, and uh, basically this, this Brownian piece here is capturing exactly that, right? I mean, it's kind of this, a lot of it, a lot of the variation generated from this piece here is from a lot of small moves uh, in the stock price. And so that's a natural place basically to, to look at at the money option prices. And so, um, Somebody asked me here about what you would do with, what will happen with the black shoals implied vol. And so for once, and there's probably the only slide in all of these three hours of lecturing where I, I have black shoals implied vol, okay? Then maybe there is a second slide, I think, later on. Okay, so in any case, what I did here is the following thing. I simulated from a Heston model with jumps, okay? And I uh, basically, and then, I, because it's a simulation, I, uh, I, uh, I calculated options with different, the black shoals implied vols from that model for options with different times to expiration, okay? And so here, uh, the units of time here are days, which means that trading days, T equals one is one day, two days, five days, eight days. When, oops. Uh, when I did that, of course, I was thinking that's kind of, of course, mostly for pedagogical purposes because I wasn't thinking we will be trading one day options. But here we are, that actually is kind of relevant now. Oops. Um, and so what you can see is uh, um, where is the true volatility? The true volatility is somewhere close to 10, 12%. I forgot what was the number I put. And you can see that uh, different maturities really differ a lot here in the tails, but they do actually, uh, they, they do share a lot of similarities here. And this is where the true, well, the true volatility is somewhat closer basically to, to, the, uh, uh, to the black shoals implied volatility you see uh, at the money. And so uh, that's a natural thing and actually people have used in the past um, in somewhat informal sense basically said, okay, we know black shoals doesn't work but black shoals implied vol at the money is sort of close to the true volatility. It's a good proxy. And so, so how good of a proxy is this indeed? Um, you can do a very simple expansion. That's really a, just like a Taylor expansion uh, of the option price at the money, okay? Um, and uh, you, can, you can get it. So option price at the money, you can see basically that, uh, by the way, here, this is a log strike, but I have normalized the current stock price to one. So K, little k, which is a log strike equal to zero, means that I'm at the money. So that's kind of a easier normalization. So K equals zero, means at the money, okay? And so forget about this KT, which is a kind of something which approaches zero. So think about K here, KT, re replace it with zero. And what you're getting is F of zero, 
which is the standard normal density evaluated at zero, times square root of sigma t, this thing drops out, and then you have something of order approximation error of order at t, which basically means that uh, the spot volatility, you can recover it square root of two pi times the option price at the money option price, or if you prefer, you can just say implied vol is uh, at the money implied vol is basically an approximation uh, for the uh, for the spot volatility. Okay, so the, so so if time to maturity goes down to zero, it's basically uh, the, the at the money black shows is giving you the uh, it's an approximation for the spot volatility. So then I ask myself, well, how good is this approximation? And so again, I use the same model that I used. So okay, so I use the same model that I used for generating these plots here, okay? And I simulated it, but I just simulated it over a number of days, okay? So not just a single day, I simulated it over a number of days, and this is time in days, uh, so this is business day convention, so that's basically one year of data. I simulated one year of data, what you see, the blue line is the true volatility, and the dash line is the at the money spot, uh, at the money black shows volatility for option which has a one week to expiration. Okay, option with one week to this is really short, right? This is one week to expiration, and I'm looking at the money black shows. Okay, so um, what you can see is that that approximation actually. Um, well, it's an approximation, but it's not a very good approximation because the gap is really f nearly 50%, right? I mean, you're uh, kind of almost, well, or rather, yeah, yeah, some over 50%, basically. You have a over 50% bias, and what's worse about it is that the dynamics, that the gap is actually kind of varying over time. So it's not like a level shift or something like this, neither it's proportional. So it's kind of, uh, basically, they, they have something, this model, by the way, was a model where you had uh, uh, Heston volatility and then you had jump intensity proportional to volatility. So in some sense, everything is very close to volatility. So the dynamics even should be very close, but you know, and why they are first order, they are similar, they still uh, quite a big uh, difference. And then, okay, so then you say, okay, well, uh, at this point, then you say maybe, well, that's basically it. I mean, I know that if I take the time to maturity, very close here because of this derivation, uh, because of this derivation that I showed you here, I know that eventually when capital T becomes very small, uh, that approximation should work. And uh, indeed, if I take T to less than a day, this approximation starts working somewhat. But then, yeah, but then that will be not useful or practical for most of the uh, options we have, or rather, if I restrict myself just to use it for a couple of hours during the expiration date, I don't think that's very practical. Okay, so, so, the, so there were two options from to conclude from that. Either that's a dead end, and basically that's it, or maybe just the black shows was not implied vol at the money was not the optimal thing to do, and so um, and. Luckily, it turned out that this is the case, meaning that there's something else you can do which is better than this, which can get you closer to the true volatility. And that's what we're going to do now. And you know what? It will be based on the same type of analysis that we saw in the first, first part today. So in that sense, everything is kind of um, connected. Um, so again, I will apply that formula. I will apply that formula um, that we've seen before that I showed you from Karen Madan, uh, which basically allows you to do option spending and to spend any function, smooth function of the terminal price, okay? And now what I will be looking at, I will be looking, okay, so I'll ask myself, what is a convenient, so when I'm doing this, now, of course, we have to realize that I will go, I'm going to, I'm more expensive in terms of the data, right? Because I'm saying I will use all strikes. But already I'm using the strikes when I'm calculating the VIX and I have no problem with that. So I'll do the same thing here, okay? So I'm not just picking one option, now I'm going to use more strikes. But if we have them, why not? Let's go and use them. Uh, and so now I'm going to ask myself, what is the function F, which will basically separate the volatility from the jumps in an easiest way, okay? And 
when you start thinking and you start putting these things in this context, uh, then of course I have done in my earlier part, uh, earlier academic life a lot of work on high frequency data, high frequency returns. And that exactly that same question we've asked ourselves or people before me asked themselves rather because I came a little bit late. Uh, yeah, and so people were doing already things like that. And so then the first guess is to do this, uh, this thing which we I call basically smooth, trunca smooth truncation, okay? So it's very natural. So if, you are, if I look at returns, okay, the way people done in the high frequency literature is the following. You look at high frequency returns over five minutes, you calculate volatility and you say, if it's more than three standard deviation move, normal return will not generate this with a very high probability, okay? And so you say, if it's a more than three standard deviation move, that must be a jump. That's it. I mean, that's a, such a simple thing, right? Intuitive thing. And so you can try to do the same thing here. And so that's the first attempt I, I had, which is basically this smooth truncation function. So you see why, why calling it, well, first of all, this is a smooth function of X. That's why it's smooth. Why is it truncation? I mean, think about what you're doing when you're picking eta, when you start increasing the eta, okay? Basically what you're doing is you are leaving, you are down, you are putting, uh, you are downplaying or you're kind of putting a lower weight on returns, anything but zero, anything but vicinity of zero. And so that's the way basically you can tease out or separate. And the, the movements around zero are basically controlled by the diffusion. The rest is controlled by the jump. So you can do that. And so I did that. So basically I can apply, I can just apply this thing here. I can just apply this formula with this function that you see this, what I call smooth truncation. And then you basically, you play with the truncation parameter according to the, the length of the time to expiration. And, and that will basically, theoretically, it will give you what you want, okay? But at the same time, I was actually working in, in the high frequency world. What you can do, and turns out is actually it's better in the sense it allows you better to separate the volatility from the jumps, you can use characteristic functions, okay? And so why not do it here too? We, in fact, we already did it with the, with the jumps as you see. So now I will do it with the, uh, with the, with the spot volatility. Okay, so, I'm, so again, you can do this thing here, this part. I'm not going to pursue this, but it's in one of the papers I, I've written it. I might go back and just revisit because I, I just, the characteristic function is somewhat easier to do, I think. Okay, so let's go back to the characteristic function and see now <laughs> How can you tease out from the characteristic function the volatility signal? Well, uh, so remember, this is, our, this is how you will span it, or span meaning estimated from the option data. This is what I'm trying to recover, the characteristic, question, characteristic function. And this is the integral, which is basically uh, from the option data, right? So everything here is known, assuming that you also know the option data. So everything here is observable. And so basically you get a direct estimator of the conditional expectation, okay? Uh, so that's unique to option data because it's a forward looking kind of variable. And so uh, you, you can't get the same thing from the returns. There you get the empirical characteristic function, not the real, not, not the true conditional characteristic function. Okay. And now again, remember this approximation that I told you that if time to maturity is close to zero, you can pretend that the world is levy, in other words, for the, our purposes here, that volatility is constant, okay? Now, note one thing that I did here, uh, uh, unlike what I was doing before, now I'm looking at the conditional characteristic function, but I'm standardizing by square root of t. Why? Because this way, this term here, there is no dependence on t anymore, right? So, and this is the guy I'm after, okay? So in other words, what you are looking at here, now, unlike what I was doing before with the jumps, I start looking at, because I'm dividing by square root of t, and so if u is fixed and t goes to zero, that means that I'm looking at higher and higher characteristic exponents, right? Exponents which go to infinity. Does that make sense? Well, it actually makes sense because if you, if you, if you go back and look at this levi hinchin theorem and see how it's proved, the way basically it's proved that you have a one-to-one -one mapping between the law of the Levy process and the characteristic exponents is just to say that actually 
the way you separate the volatilities from the jumps, you look at in, uh, asymptotically increasing exponents and they uniquely identify this because this becomes negligible. That's how that theorem is proved. And so, they, and that's what we are going to use uh, in, this, uh, in this analysis uh, too. So the behavior of the characteristic function at infinity is controlled only by the diffusion. And the jumps, that's intuitive, right? The jumps are the big moves and so they capture the behavior around zero of the characteristic function. That's basically uh, the logic. But now we can do it a little, now you can see it a little bit more formally. So what I'm going to say here is, okay, so you have this expression, I'm after this guy, okay? And if I now look, what I can do is I can look at the real part of the characteristic function or the log characteristic function. This guy is left, it's gone. I don't need to worry about this guy anymore. I have the guy which I want and I have a mass coming from the jumps which you can hope basically is small, right? So now let's see it one more time here. So I take now the real part of the characteristic function I divided by u squared multiplied by minus two, so that, you know, to take care of this, this, this business here, okay? And, uh, and with that, I basically, I recover what I wanted to recover, which is the spot volatility, plus this thing, uh, which is coming from the jumps. And I'm hoping that this thing is small, okay? And is this thing small, okay? Uh, yes, it is, but why? And so, look why and it's very easy to do it in the simple case and then I will show in the other case and actually it works in the most general case too but why is that thing small because first off look t goes to zero so that thing goes to zero and let's just look at the normal case what most people think of the jumps are finite activity which means that if nu is like a, acts like a probability measure right if it's just a probability measure so that basically means that this, this function here is bounded and then this integral then, so this is bounded by a constant times, the, times one if this was a true probability measure, right? And so the fact that there is a division by square root of t doesn't matter here because this is in a co enters in a cosine that's a bounded function. So this whole thing is bounded and it's bounded, it's bounded by t which goes down to zero. So that thing becomes negligible, right? So, uh, so yes, yeah, so it, it has to be small. And um, now of course, you know, that's, uh, we know that there are much more general processes for jump, uh, for jump measures, not just this finite activity compound Poisson type models. And so then what you have to do is basically you have to see, well, at what rate is this measure, this level, okay, jump measure exploding at zero, okay? And you, the way you characterize it, you basically say, look for the power r. What is the smallest power of r that this measure can integrate against, okay? So this thing is called jump activity. It's a technical term, but you have to know that it lies between zero and two. And zero just basically says that this is finite activity. That just means that uh, the expected number of jumps is finite over a finite interval. And that's more, so r equals zero is what I was explaining you uh, before. But if you're not, if you're looking for more general things, then you have to basically, uh, then you have to, uh, then, then you have to kind of deal with this business with r and have that thing. It will still be bounded, but now, now, you know, now the bigger the r, the more the small jumps are, the bigger the error is here, basically. But so I think that it's much easier to just to be thinking uh, for, for the purposes of what we are doing here is just to be thinking of r equals zero, okay? r equals zero, you get an approximation of t. So now let's just compare then this type of estimation with what I just showed you with black Scholes implied vol, okay? And so on a, first theoretically uh, uh, before we go into practice. So, if, so the first part here, is the first equation is what I had before. This is the black shows. Okay, this is the add the money option price, but it's equivalent if you write it with terms of black shows implied vol. Okay, so I just use the option price. And so the error you commit here why, by treating the add the money option price or the black shows implied vol as a true volatility is of order square root of t. While here, if you use that alternative method with the characteristic function, what you get is an error which is this thing 
t to the power one minus r over two. Okay. Now, I forgot to mention here, and that actually, uh, this is probably not so smart of me to present it this way. This error is derived for the case when the jumps are finite activity. So this error, what I derived here, is for r equals zero. So you have to be looking at this with r equals to zero. So what you see here in this case is that this error is t, while the error here is square root of t. So in an asymptotic sense, this is a much smaller error than this, okay? So asymptotically, you have to justify. Basically, that tells you that you, you are having a smaller error when you're doing the separation this way. And um, so theoretically, it should be better. And we can now look at it at, um, in reality, basically, whether, what, what kind of job it does, okay? But in terms of estimation, so, so that will be my estimate of volatility. I will, I will generalize it a little bit later on, but all I'm doing is the following. You calculate the characteristic function from the options, take the logarithm minus two over u squared, and just pick the u, which is relatively high, and that's it. And I will tell you how to pick the u uh, uh, afterwards. But that, that's basically, that's all it is. So here's uh, a calculation of this quantity uh, with using data. Um, uh, uh, so what do I plot here? Okay, uh, let me show you, let me tell you. Uh, so I've plotted the, so let me go back. So what I plotted is, is this quantity, this quantity, okay, for all values of u, or for a range of values of u, and I used different capital T, okay? So, uh, so let's go back here. So this is for all values of u from zero to a high number, okay? Well, whatever, to a number of 25, okay? And uh, this is, uh, okay, and so what you see on the y-axis is my estimator of volatility, which is basically this quantity, right? This quantity here. This is my estimator of volatility. All right, and, um, and what you see, the blue line, so this thing corresponds to, I forgot, I, one thing corresponds to f one week and this thing to two weeks, okay? The true level of volatility, so because I'm, I, I'm, this is a controlled experiment in a Monte Carlo, I know what the true vol level of volatility is, and that's basically the solid line here. Okay. So what do you see? Basically, as u goes to infinity, this, uh, this estimator is approaching the true volatility. It's basically, it's converging to the true level of volatility, and if you pick a value around here, Basically, the approximation error in percentage terms would be less than a percent or something like this, which is pretty, pretty good. It's not 50% as we had it before, but it's more like 1% or something like this. Okay, that's theoretically, yeah. Right, and there will be, so there's no error right now here, yeah, that's true. So this is, this is a simulation in which option prices were the true option prices, no error, no anything. So that, that will play a role because uh, for where I picked the U. So I'll come back to this. Yeah, I'll come back to this. The, yeah, you're not going to see them in the data so smooth, <laughs> uh, those lines. But before I do that, just to draw your attention, just to see where the things are, because this, uh, I think it's quite intuitive. Um, well, after I've been so much used to seeing this, do you know what they see they actually these guys start at the same point do you know what that point is so basically do you know what happens if i take in other words do you know what happens if i take the limit now of this thing but u goes to zero what do you get you get the return variance the total variance so basically the limit of the of the characteristic function of this quantity when u goes to zero, it's a very simple algebra to derive. You will derive the second moment of the return and standardize, so you annualize it. And so what you are basically, in other words, what you're getting here, when u is equal to zero, you're getting the VIX index, okay? And, but the VIX index contains the jumps and all that kind of mess, okay? And as you increase u, you basically, you separate the jumps and risk premium and all of the, all of the, all of the other stuff, which is not in the true data, and you're getting down to the spot volatility, to the true volatility, basically. So, I, 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 I'm not going to pursue. I, no, I, I didn't. I, no, I did derive. I did derive results for it. Uh, 
kind of, uh, but I didn't, I did not do anything. I, I think that, I think that this is better. I think that this is better, but I'm not so sure whether, well, okay. I think that this one is better because it's much easier to characterize the biases in this thing and then to bias correct. The other one, um, maybe, yeah, I don't know. I didn't pursue it basically. It's smooth, so maybe maybe it's not that bad either. So, I, but uh, um, I was heavily influenced by characteristic functions back then, so, <laughs> so I persisted with this. Um, yeah. No, it's that, that, yeah, that's a difficult connection to make. No, unfortunately. So this is there. The top is VIX, but I, I, I can't point to Black Scholes where that will be on the picture. No, it's, it's. I, I think it's kind of. I thought about this, and that there was. A, anyways, it's. A, I, I. Yeah, I had some ideas and something to to connect with the uh, uh, with the implied voles because. Uh, I vaguely remember something Peter Carr mentioning to me something about this back in the day, but then I just couldn't recover. There were some ways of you can represent the VIX alternatively with the Black Scholes formulas, implied voles, but I, I, then I couldn't recover that kind of. Uh, I remember him mentioning this to me at some conference, and then I couldn't uh, see. I didn't have any record of that, so I, I so I don't know. I didn't explore this further. But there must be some ways to connect. It's just not so obvious to me how. Um, okay, so now, all right, so this is basically, this was a very kind of, obviously, this is, this was all stylized, no observation error, no anything, I didn't tell you even how to choose you, but if you, but, so the hope is that if I can actually, if I'm very free to choose high values of you, I should be able to recover well the, 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 the true level of volatility, okay, so, uh, the, now, what you have to remember that there's observation error, there's finite strike grid, there's all sorts of things like this. And so we will need to deal with that. So the same notation as I had before, so we don't need to worry about this. So they have the delta, the strike grid, discrete strike grid, you have observation errors, they're centered, they have volatility and things like this. And uh, and your estimator then will become basically you, the discretized version of the integral we saw before. So this is what you you will get. So uh, this is your conditional characteristic function, but basically the Riemann sum uh, version of the integral we saw before. So and then I will define my estimator of the variance by this transformation of the conditional characteristic function. Right. Okay. So. And then you can derive and characterize the behavior of this characteristic function and you can say what is the approximation error. It's uh, the different sources of approximation error. You can say what is driving this. Maybe we should skip that slide and not, not worry too much about the, there is a CLT associated with this, but it's probably not so important. So what's more important if you wanna apply this thing is just basically how do you pick the U, okay? And then here we have a classical bias variance trade-off. Because if you remember um, from this plot, what you want to do, if you want to minimize the bias, what you want to do is pick U as high as possible because this is where the information about the jumps is gone or any kind of this PQ wedge kind of stuff, it's gone. And so this is, you're getting the true volatility. But of course, the problem with picking very, very high U is that if you have tried to estimate conditional, uh, if you have tried to estimate characteristic functions from data, empirical characteristic functions, you know that for very high values of the characteristic argument, they become very noisy because what they're doing is they're kind of doing these oscillations and then basically any small noise gets kind of flared up. And so it, you, can't, you, you can't just do that. And so what you have to do is something sensible like this. You just say, okay, so I will stop the first time the conditional characteristic function takes a relatively small value, but which is not that small to, to kind of make the estimation bad. And so you'll, you basically, you compute a characteristic function, 
take the norm of it and see the first, it, it usually kind of mono, doesn't need to be monotone, but it kind of monotone is typically the case. And the first times it crosses a relatively low threshold, but not as low as you kind of to think that this is super noisy, you basically, you stop, okay? And, and that's it. And so, uh, and that's how we are choosing, that's how we are choosing, uh, that's how we're choosing the, the U. Um, point three is what I experiment. I, I've tried with point two, point twenty-five, whatever, these kinds of things. It, it doesn't, yeah, I think it's fine. Uh, it doesn't make much of a difference uh, afterwards. But something where you want to pick it high, but not high enough to be too noisy, basically. Okay. So let me just show you a little bit on data, what, what gets in and what gets out of this estimation, okay? So here's one snapshot of a data which we, um, out, basically out of the money options that we are going to use to calculate spot volatility for, for that date, January 20th, 2016. This is five, I think this was just a week to expiration. Look how beautiful, nice and smooth the data looks, by the way. Uh, data quality has increased a lot. Although, of course, because the, 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 the scale, everything kind of, any small kind of perturbations are hidden, because you see, I'm plotting option prices, not black shows implied volatilities and things like this. But nevertheless, it is relatively smooth, the data, as you can see. So this is, so this is at the money here, and here are the puts, and here are the calls. We have a lot of them, as you can see. Um, by the way, um, one thing, just to, I mentioned this before, but I said that now, this, this expansion that, uh, that basically here, that we are doing, uses all options with all strikes, right? And so you're kind of thinking, but how the heck, you know, is there any information left in deep, deep, deep out of the money options? So something which is 10 sigmas down, put about the spot volatility. And the answer there is none. Okay, and although I'm including it, the weights you are assigning to those options deep, deep out of the money is very low. And so, in fact, asymptotically, you can show that if you can, you can just use a fixed range and everything will work. You don't need to go that much. The intuition is correct. Deep out of the money inputs have nothing to do with the spot volatility. Sorry? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Because that's the, the first order effect is the spot vol. This is volatility dynamics, right? The volatility jump, yeah. So, and now, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is just to, because if you're thinking a little bit, you might be confused. Why, why all of a sudden I'm kind of making use of all of these options going all the way out, uh, uh, deep out of the money, like, like these strikes here. They're just pure speculation about what might happen in the tail, but nothing to do probably with reality. Okay. Um, okay, and so this is the data. Then what you do is you do this calculation. You put this data, the option prices, you plug those option prices here. You calculate this characteristic function. And then you plot it against u. And you choose the value of u for which the characteristic function or the norm of it is 0.3. And you stick with it. And so here's what I plot now here is basically then I can do, I can look at, well, let me look at, let me, that's basically a portfolio, right? A portfolio of options. Uh, and I can look at the real part of the characteristic function and the imaginary part, okay? The real part is what actually gets calculated or used in the calculation of the spot volatility. And this is the weight you put in that portfolio uh, to different options with different strikes. Remember, this is at the money and then basically to the left you are seeing out of the money puts and to the right you are seeing out of the money calls. And see what this estimator is doing is basically the following. It puts the highest weight of options which are around the money and then this weight starts dropping. And in fact, it becomes like a long short portfolio, right? Because here you are long these options and then you become a little bit short some of these options uh, which are closer to the money but not that far from the money. And then you go a little bit long again, and then it basically become flat, okay? So it's like a long short portfolio. And the way to think about this shorting part is basically is that you are bias correcting. This is kind of, this is the estimator's effort to kind of clean for the effect from the jumps. Well, at least this is how I think about 
about this. And exactly as I told you, you know, the very, very high kind of deep out of the money options don't contribute to, 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 to this estimator. If you were to calculate, if you were to kind of compare this with say the weights that you are assigning in a VIX index calculation, and then you will see basically that the VIX index in relative terms, it's putting more weight on the options which go out of the money because it's trying to capture the total volatility, not just the volatility coming from the, the diffusive piece, but also from, uh, from the jumps. Okay, and now if you look at also the imaginary part, although we are not using the imaginary part in our calculations, but it's nice to see what's happening with the imaginary part of the portfolio and that uh, the characteristic function. And you see, that's like a long short. That's like you are going here, you are long the calls, you are short the puts, but you are long the calls, short the puts around the money, okay? And around the money, this option price is nearly symmetric. And so they cancel out and you get something, a number close to zero. Okay, um, which is good because that's another way to confirm it, kind of the approximation is working because that's what should happen for high values of U. You should basically, the jumps should not matter and there's no other symmetry left in the return distribution because the diffusion is symmetric. And so, and so that's, but that's how it kind of cancels, uh, cancels out. Yeah, so that's, that's basically the magic of these calculations. So I think it's kind of useful to see how the, the, these calculations map into the data. And it's not a very, uh, so I think it's a relatively intuitive uh, thing. Okay, so when you calculate it on the data, so this is calculation from 2010. So now, okay, so in this case, as I said, remember a spot volatility. Well, you can also estimate it potentially from returns. And in fact, I will have a little bit more to say about this uh, in a few minutes, okay? So you can, now, now I can actually, uh, before when I'm estimating jump tails, well, they are on the queue, nothing to do with P, I can always hide myself. Well, that's basically what the option data told you, you know, like uh, that, 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 there's no way to cross validate and to check that this is the real thing, uh, other than run this kind of return predictability things that I showed you. But here, if this is the true volatility, I, it should be comparable with the thing which you can measure from returns, right? I can just estimate I can just estimate, I, I can use squared returns over uh, some short window of time and basically get my estimator volatility, okay? And so what you see on this plot is basically what you recover with the black line, which is the option-based estimator, and, uh, and uh, in the red circles are return-based ones. I deliberately put the red circles, the return-based ones, because they are obviously and visibly much noisier than the option-based ones. And in fact, one of the reasons, one of the motivations for doing this black shows implied vol in the literature was the idea that because these are forward looking measures, the expectations, they should be much less noisier than the return based measures. And that's why you prefer to extract these volatility measures from the options. And so they are, and that, that's indeed, it's confirmed. You can see that the black is more or less in the middle of this kind of uh, red cloudiness. But you can see that the levels are actually pretty similar. Um, Probably, yeah, I mean, we need to scrutinize and we will look a little bit deeper into this, so uh, whether it's all rosy. And one way to look deeper into this is to look in the year of 2020, when in one year we had very low volatility and very high level volatility. So that's basically an ideal laboratory for kind of all sorts of things, uh, whether they are working properly. And so now I'm zooming in on 2020. Uh, and so you can much clearly see the red circles and the black line, and that's what you get. And I, I think that actually this works pretty well in the sense that uh, if you look at this, the black line is shadowing the red circles, um, both when the volatility really spiked up crazily high, but also uh, when it went down uh, uh, by a lot. Okay, so so it's basically. So what that means is that unlike that, so if I was to plot the VIX or the black shows at the money volatility, which you saw on the simulation, they will be just a level up, kind of elevated by a 40, 50 percent uh, 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 above. So that's kind of, uh, they will be way above the true, um, the true volatility or the measures of true volatility. <laughs> so I will go now to, now I'm going to this. Okay, so, okay, so now let's go to this because now, so, of course, you can ask yourself at this point, so, okay, 
So what's the big deal? So I mean, okay, so it's kind of nice. You can estimate volatility from options, uh, spot volatility. It's good. In a way, it's kind of comforting to know that, you know, in spite of all that craziness in the options and overpricing, of, I don't know, overpricing, but pricing uh, things, right? I mean, there's all these premiums built into the option prices, actually, that when you kind of do the analysis, you can go back to the true kind of riskiness of the of the of the return so that's kind of i was happy about that but then you ask yourself okay uh, it looks like the black line is much smoother than the red line which it should be because again this black line is based on options which are expectations and you sh expectations should be a much it's much less noisy uh than uh, than realization right so you would think that it should it should give you an advantage okay so, but then, so then, what we should do is uh, put them on the same footing and basically say, okay, think how is op what is the optimal way basically uh, to combine those two estimators, right? Because that's the ultimate. That we have two alternative measures of the same thing, and so there should be an optimal way to combine the two things uh, into producing the best estimator, right? I mean, from a theoretical point of view, econometric point of view, that's the thing to do, and so. Um, so first to remind those of you who don't deal with returns and high frequency stuff that the, the estimators which were the red lines or the red dots that you were seeing before were the ones uh, formed from this. These are just sum of squared returns, okay? And then you truncate them to get rid of the jumps, okay? So the, basically this is a non-smooth truncation because you see it's an indicator function and if the return, you keep the returns only if they are a certain level, a certain threshold, uh, below a certain threshold, if they are, say, three sigmas, three standard deviation moves. So anything which is below three standard deviation moves, you keep it, okay? And the rest, you chop it off because it's, uh, it's due to jumps, okay? So, so that's, your that's your return based estimator of volatility. And if you want to, I mean, what I was looking at the options is the spot volatility. So if you want to be calculating spot volatility here, well, you have to be, the window over which you are calculating this should be relatively short. Basically, you should be looking over a small window. And so, but of course, you know, okay, so if I'm using five minutes, as I use here five minutes, uh, what's a short window? Maybe five hours or something like this, otherwise the estimate is too noisy, something like this, okay? You can go to, I don't know, you can go to seconds, but then you'll have to deal with noise. and things like this, so I didn't do that, okay. In any ways, what comes, so the beautiful thing of all of this analysis is that from the analysis we are doing here and from the analysis what others have done about these measures here, uh, you can summarize it and basically in these two lines here that OV stands for the option-based estimator of volatility and TV, I should have, stands for the truncated volatility or the realized volatility, basically the return-based estimator of volatility. They all estimate, they all estimate the volatility, the spot volatility, the true volatility, but they all have an extra error term, which is uh, an extra error term, which approximately, so this is not exact, but it's an approximate sense, okay, which is something which is standard normal, standard normal here, and basically asymptotic variance, so, so some kind of the variance of the measurement error, which you kind of can quantify. Okay, so, and the nice thing about this is that these this errors here, these are asymptotically independent. So this, these two things are independent from each other, okay? So the option, the error in the option data comes from the measurement error in the options, right? It's just at the point in time, I'm looking at options with different strikes, and there's a measurement error, bid ask spreads and things like this. This is basically the equivalent of microstructure noise in the return data. And here, sorry, so okay, ju just a second. So so let, let so let's so let's let me finish, and I'll come back to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's fine. Uh, you're also being recorded this way. Yeah. So, so, okay, uh, and so this one here, it's driven by the Martingale component of the price, right? That's basically what drives the. Well, if you, I assume that there's no microstructure noise in the return data. Now, okay, so. The error in the option uh, in the options, yes. Um, so uh, so okay. So it is indeed true that what I'm saying is that the error in the observation error in the options is orthogonal 
to the price movements, okay? That's, that's an assumption, okay? Now, it's not a crazy assumption because, especially if you are thinking of this estimate of volatility being before the time of the, 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 so this time, usually how do you form this? You form a local window, and if this local window is before time t, then actually this will be, so this is like an innovation term, right? So that they will be uncorrelated. So, so in that sense, I don't think this is a crazy thing to assume to, to, to this, uh, this way. But it is indeed true that it's an assumption that the observation error in the options conditionally on the price path is centered at zero and, and independent. And so basically just that, that's what gives you uh, the result. If you have this result though, then the optimal thing to do is what you combine the two forecasts, uh, not the, they're not forecasts, sorry, the two <laughs> estimators of volatility. And the estimator, and basically the weights are according to the precision in the estimation, right? And this thing, time varies because the precision in the estimation can change over time. So on some day, I don't have enough option data, and probably you will tilt more towards the return-based estimator. On other, way, other days, it can be the opposite and things like this. So we, we can compute those asymptotic variances and we can compute this ratio. For the SPX, this is more like 80% basically is driven by options and the remaining part is by returns. If you do it for individual names, it's more like 50-50 basically. That's, uh, that's how the, sp the, the, uh, the, the, the breakdown is. Okay, so that will be the, the optimal thing to do. But again, if, if you're looking at the market index options, so if you look at market index, market index volatility, most of, the, most of this efficient volatility estimator will be basically uh, determined essentially from the options, okay. All right, so now I will consider one short application, okay, um, to volatility forecasting because, so they are different, so, okay, option data, at the very least should give you a more precise estimator of volatility, spot volatility at a given point in time. You can use it for event studies and things like this, or you can do it and just say, okay, if it is a, if it is a good estimator, if it's a good, better estimator of volatility, I should improve uh, in forecasting sense, right? Um, maybe that's not the best application because, because we can generate better forecasts um, using different proxies and things like this, right? So, but so the way to control for these kinds of things, I'm saying, okay, what's your best forecasting model? And um, I don't know. Uh, the popular one that people use is this HAR model. Uh, I don't know. Uh, have you heard of this hetero? Uh, how is that? Uh, hetero heterogeneous? No, uh, autoregressive model, right? So basically, the idea, uh, the idea that instead of doing the many legs, you constrain the legs in the forecasting exercise. And so you say, you, you look at the past day volatility, past week volatility, and past month volatility. And that's kind of a nice way to proxy for the kind of long run, uh, kind of long run, uh, you know, long memory feature of, of, of volatility. I don't care what's the best forecasting model. So, but let's say that this is the forecasting model, which most people use actually. And so then I will say, okay, well, if that's the best forecasting model, I should improve on it by just using better volatility proxy in it, okay? So in other words, if people were using realized volatility, that's what they were doing for most part, okay? I, if I substitute the realized volatility with my option-based estimator or with my efficient estimator, which combines return and options, I should improve, okay? Um, people have used also the truncated volatility and then we also uh, compare with that, okay? And so here's what you will get when you do this. Um, okay, so here's one table which summarizes this. It's a, uh, let me, uh, let's see, uh, what do we see here? Um, basically, these are forecasting losses, comparison of forecasting losses over one day horizon one week horizon and one month horizon. So this is the standard type of horizons people have looked for volatility forecasting, okay? And then, boy, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot happening here. So you can use a window, a rolling window to forecast the volatility. Basically, you're estimating the model over a rolling window. 
say, say a period of five years, and then you move it five years and five years. Or you can do an increasing window if you just believe that the model parameters are not shifting around, okay? We can do it either way. Then uh, you can use different criteria for, for, for judging the forecasting performance. Mean squared error is the common one, but it's very sensitive to outliers, so you can use this Q-like, basically, um, uh, criterion as well. And, um, yeah, and then you have the different models. Now, forecasting losses, uh, the numbers to me, don't mean anything, so I normalize things, or we normalize things. Uh, and the benchmark will be this model in which I'm using the return-based estimator of volatility, okay? So that's why you, hear, uh, you see in this column everywhere once. So number below one means that you are beating that model in an out-of-sample sense, forecasting error sense, and the number above one means that you are losing against the model, okay? So, okay, so if you look at this RV is the original specification in some sense, um, and so uh, it's very close to this hard TV, which truncated variance model. So that, that, that they are similar. So I'm not making any point about this. Hard Q is something that um, Tim and Andrew have proposed as a way to tame the realized variance or the measurement er error in the realized variance. You see that actually sometimes it works, but sometimes really not. Um, and then here comes the, the one in which you plug in just the option-based estimator volatility, okay? So you, you, you tend to see numbers below one, not always. Once in a while you get this kind of, basically on this increasing window and Q-like criterion, you are seeing actually sometimes numbers above one. And my guess for that is that, um, well, basically the measurement error in the volatility, the option-based volatility has shifted over time and this must have contributed. And when you're using an increasing window, that's basically you're tying your hands or you are confusing the data. But when you do the, the, the ones where you combine the, the option volatility and the, and the return-based ones, they are uniformly basically below one. And you, you see improvements around 20% basically, which 20% on something which has been claimed to be already improved a lot is, uh, is it's, it's quite, it's quite non-trivial. Okay. Sorry? So, yeah, okay, so you do pay attention to the details, uh, Ilze. Very good. Um, so, what is MV? Um, did I say it? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I do say it. Yeah, that's basically, so, yes. Oops. Sorry, okay. So, what I did is, uh, uh, one way, to get the two data sources together, the option-based and the return-based one, is uh, to put them like in this way. Oops. Is to put them in this way, the weights according to the estimators for the asymptotic variance, okay. Now, this unfortunately relies on precise estimators of asymptotic variance, which is variance of variance, which not so good. <laughs> People have written a lot about these quarticities and all that kind of stuff, which is really problematic. And so what I decided instead, what we decided is one way is, okay, so I can constrain it. And um, oh. so again, put it basically un unconstrained. So I'll just put the, the option-based estimator and the return-based estimator without forcing the weights in them being driven by the estimated <laughs> asymptotic variances. And so the goal of this was just not to if the, if the estimators of the asymptotic variances of these measures is polluted, I don't want that to be impacting a forecasting model. And so you just left them unrestricted. And then that thing tends to, I think it tends to work best. If I look at the numbers here, if I remember, it, it is comparable when you're using rolling windowses with the EV estimator, but when you start using the increasing window, you start seeing deviations basically. Uh, so, which tells you, you probably want to, yeah. The estimators of the asymptotic variance can, can be somewhat poorer, and so you probably don't want to pollute it. In any case, what you, by and large, what you see from this is that, um, that, that there's, a, there's a scope for improvement, even though already vol volatility forecasting has been a topic beaten kind of to death, and I don't know whether you can keep squeezing more improvements. Um, 
Okay, so, and so now I will do one more application here and that will be to return predictability just to, and so this is more like if you want kind of a, kind of economically for a motivated one. And so remember that what I did um, in the previous lecture before the break is uh, I told you how equity returns can be predicted with variance risk premium. People have claimed this in, the, in earlier work. And I said, okay, well, the tail parameter, the tail component of the, the, of the jumps is actually should be the predictor. If, you, if it's real, if it's really something which is only from the Q coming and not from the P, that's basically it should affect, it should predict equity returns going forward. Okay, we did this thing. And so now what I will go, and basically I will go back to this predictive regression, but I will go to the original variance risk premium predictive regression that people did without questioning why they are doing it this way, okay? And so basically, remember what that thing was, was, uh, so what that, uh, here you see it actually defined what variance risk premium is for those of you who haven't seen it. You take the VIX, you square it because VIX is reported in standard deviation units, okay? And then you subtract from it realized volatility over month. This subscript M there stands for a month. So that basically means a monthly volatility, okay? And so now what I can do now is basically I can get a much better, now that I, uh, the, the problem and, and, and this, in this, if you have paid attention to this literature, people have criticized the authors a lot for, um, for using this because this is a very noisy measure. Basically, they use past month volatility, okay, in the construction of this, which is a very poor proxy for actually the actual volatility going forward, or can be, a, it basically volatility over a month is not a unit root, okay? That's what, the, in, the, in a nutshell, the criticism was about, okay? Um, and so now, if I have a much better estimate of volatility, I can just basically substitute their realized volatility with uh, my estimate of volatility, right? Because what I, what, what, okay, so the realized volatility has two components, one coming from the jumps. These are realized jumps. I have nothing to say about them. So this is this difference, realized variance minus the truncated variance. And this just captures basically whatever jumps you have over that month. That's what it is. We can't do anything about it. But then the second piece is the one coming from the estimator of volatility. And I can plug in here my estimated or, or efficient volatility estimator, okay? And so that will be my alternative measure of variance risk premium. Um, so variance risk premium one, which is the original one, and variance risk premium two, which is my improved estimator because now I have a better estimator of volatility. Um, and then, of course, I can also just the jump risk premium measure, which is the jump vari variation, which is VIX minus the spot volatility, minus the realized volatility minus truncated volatility from the returns. And so that's just the jump variation uh, measure. Okay, so I can do that. And now let's see what kind of return predictability you get from this. Um, okay, so, and so here the results, so let's, uh, let's just stare at them for a little bit uh, and see whether we can, see whether you can actually spot things. Um, okay, so these are the t-statistics, so we can actually focus on t-statistics. So, and what is on the x-axis? These are return predictability regressions, but uh, what you see on the x-axis is the horizon in months. So you are looking at return predictability over the next month, all the way to 12 months into the future, which basically in one year from now, right? So that's what you're looking at, all right? And remember, well, I'm predicting future equity returns, and I'm using this as predictors. The, the VRP one is the class, the, the one that have been used and uh, has been talked a lot in the literature. This is my improved version of it, just without questioning why you are subtracting here past month volatility, but just a better version of this and then the jump is premier kind of uh, component. And so the VRP one, which is the original predictor is the one with the stars. So you see the star here at one month, it looks like five, then it drops down to three, then it goes down to five, then it goes to five and a half or six, 
then it drops down basically and, and it tanks down. So it's like that typical thing that they, they have seen that kind of the predictive, uh, the predictive ability spikes around three, four months and then it drips down very, very sharply. And, you know, it looked a little bit suspicious. Why is exactly kind of spiking up there and kind of then disappearing? If you change just the way you calculate this realized volatility, you see with a kind of a, what I argue is a more efficient estimate of volatility, then that feature of the data is gone. Uh, ways, that, uh, ways that VRP2 is the circles. You basically start here and you're just climbing in a much more controlled way. So you still, I mean, you still exceed the critical value of two or 1.96 or whatever that number is here. It's uh, about, but uh, in a much smoother way, you don't have this kind of spike and go down. And in any case, it just looks very, very different. And in addition to that, this is much more in line with what you get with a jump risk premium estimator, where basically the, the thing is kind of, they, they shadow each other very closely, right? So measurement of volatility or precise measurement of volatility can make a big difference of uh, all these kinds of conclusions, so especially when you start doing this kind of analysis where um, you claim that the variance risk premium is a predictor and people try to rationalize this in an equilibrium settings and things like that. So um, yeah, this can have a real impact. Yeah. So what I replace, the, the only change is, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of unnecessary number of notations here, I guess. But so they are the same in terms of the, the VIX, right? The, 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 the Q thing is the same. I, I replaced the realized volatility, which they used, with one. Okay, so I split it into two parts. One is due to the jumps. I can't say anything about this. But then the one which is coming from the true volatility, the diffusive volatility, I replace it with the one which I estimated from the options data. Yeah. Right. Is the spot? Yeah, the spot. You mean the VIX? So it's the VIX, no, 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 but I can do it with the short dated thing. No, no, no but you are right. Right, right, right. Th that, no, no, that makes total sense. And the point of this is just to say, there was no, what was the argument for them to use the monthly volatility? You say that monthly volatility just doesn't change much, right? So, and if that's the argument, then I should, actually I should be okay with the spot volatility, plugging it there, right? And what that shows is just that it makes a very, very big difference. So some of this return predictability that they are seeing for, uh, spiking up around months one, two, three, it's actually coming from the realization of volatility shocks. It's not about risk premium, it's volatility shocks. And so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not making economic, much more economic interpretations of that, but just, just the measurement thing is a non-trivial thing. It's just, it, it, yeah, one can't just underestimate that, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, now, some of you might have asked me, uh, but you didn't. Uh, uh, let's see, by the way, can I drink this water or not? Well, that, that's not for me probably, okay, so let's, let's not, uh, let's not. I, I got thirsty, but uh, so, so if this water will be good. Um, okay, now, um, this is probably less critical now that I can go all the way down to zero DTE or one day options and things like this. But before, for the earlier part of the sample, when I'm applying these estimators, I'm very conservative and I use very conservative and I look like a five day option or two weeks options, etc. And then the whole argument I was doing here was pretending that volatility over that interval of time is constant, right? Now, it's not as bad if, uh, if you're doing it in a high frequency context, uh, because here you're looking at expectations and expectations is probably not so bad, but nevertheless, it isn't, yeah, it's a little bit, there's some smoothing going on, right? Because you're kind of, you're smoothing, uh, if you're expecting a kind of a volatility spike over the next 10 minutes, 
that's probably in the five days to expiration, it will be smoothed out, right? Some, some, something like this. And so, so it is a, yeah. Um, how much is there basically a bias due to the fact that the time to maturity is short, but not as short? And so, um, so what that means now is basically I need to go and try to expand even more the characteristic function and to see what kind of biases I can get from the mean reversion essentially of volatility kind of kicking in here. And uh, it turns out this is possible to be, do, uh, to be done. Not, uh, it's uh, much more complicated, but it's doable. Uh, it's complicated to derive, but when you derive it, it's actually the expression is intuitive. So what you get is, uh, remember this is my estimator of the volatility, the log of the characteristic function standardized here. So I have the spot volatility. I have this contribution due to the jumps, which I told you, you can kind of, we can successfully more or less ignore it. And then when you do the expansion, you get a term which looks like this. It's proportional to time times something which depends on the characteristic exponent, okay? And then you have some even higher order terms. So what does that mean is, okay, yes, this, all of this, by the way, is coming from mean reversion in volatility. If volatility is higher today, it's mean reverting back to the, its unconditional mean and vice versa. And so, but then if now I allow myself to use two maturities, right, two maturities, uh, I can cancel that bias term because it's like, you see, this is the, uh, the, 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 this is the thing which I did here. So it's like, um, is that for me? Did the best we can do? What is that? Uh, cold water? Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. It's very good. And maybe there will be even better drinks later on. Maybe, maybe. maybe. Okay, if we work hard. All right. So you see, this is uh, this is really an easy uh, estimate. So it's like uh, this is like it's not a forward variance, but you see what what you're doing by this is you're trying to cancel this piece here, this bias term here. So these things due to mean reversion. Okay. So you can do it, and we did it. And uh, if you're really picky and if you're really afraid that the jumps can matter and that actually they can matter in the way that there are a lot of small jumps of them. So this is more like for the theoretically oriented people. Um, uh, so you can try and bias correct for this thing uh, as well. The way to do it is just look at how this, look at how this function behaves as u changes. And you can get a sense of this piece here if it's present and get, uh, try to get rid of it too. So you can do that too. And so, um, and then, so we did that, and uh, basically what we wanted to see is does this improve our estimators of volatility, in the, does this reduce potential biases in our estimators of volatility? So how do you measure that? And so I'll be, I'll be paying attention to time, so don't worry. Um, uh, so basically what you can do is, there are different ways to quantify this, but you can look at your, true, your estimator from the returns, okay? And you can compare it with the estimator you get from the options. And if the difference between the two is just measurement error, if you expect that that measurement error is not persistent over time, you should see that the autocorrelation of this gap is zero, right? If, or or it's, it's kind of weak, okay? That's one way to measure this, whether you are capturing this effect, okay? And so this is what, uh, what we did here. So we plotted the autocorrelation of the difference between the spot volatility estimator from the options. So I guess this guy and a return-based estimator. We did it in logs because if you don't do it in logs, basically the data, be, it's kind of noisy and then nothing is significant, okay? So, so but in logs, it's a much more difficult challenge to, 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 to um, it's a much higher threshold, okay. And so this is the original estimator that I was showing you until now. And this is one in which you correct for these biases, potential biases, which are basically given by this, this maturity, this kind of this combining these two maturities, okay. And so you do indeed see that the autocorrelation starts dropping. They don't completely disappear, but are much weaker now. And if you compare with the Black-Scholes one, they're actually 
are much smaller. If you correct for the jumps, you get probably a tiny bit of reduction, but not by much. So there's still a little bit of, there's still a little bit of, um, you know, autocorrelation. So there's some persistence in this error, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's that big. What you can do also, now this thing is a little bit, okay, so you might say that they, uh, the observation error is autocorrelated and that's a possibility too. So, so you, that I cannot split from that. But what I can do to control for that is just to look at the gap between the, the return base estimator and the option base estimator and see whether it depends on past volatility, okay? It should, if that's truly observation error, it should not matter on the, the true thing, which is the true volatility. And so this, this plots basically for the different option-based estimators, just compare this. Um, the t statistics are on the, with the blue circles. If you do the original estimator, you get a t statistic of around 12. Then you, when you do the bias correction, you reduce it for the mean reversion, you reduce it to six. And when you do this thing for the jumps, you reduce it even more to four, and basically it's essentially gone, almost no uh, dependence. If you look at the black Scholes implied vol, it's much higher and it kind of persists basically, it doesn't disappear with the, uh, with the leg, which tells you that, uh, you know, that basically uh, this gap is capturing something which is true about true volatility, which is not supposed, it's not just a measurement error uh, in, the different, uh, in the different estimators. Okay, so in a nutshell, basically, these bias reductions can give you a little bit of improvement. They are not that critical most of the time, but if you are running into an extreme period in when volatility was very high, say, during the pandemic, this type of bias corrections are uh, useful. Okay, yeah. It's a very good question. Very, very good question. So let me come back to that. Let me come back to that. Uh, I, will, I, I will tell you one more thing and then I'll come back to that and relate that. And that, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. So I'll come back to this uh, and that's how I'll conclude. But so just before, uh, before I do that, just to, let, to tell you, once you have the spot volatility estimator, you can do any, any sort of things. And so for example, one thing that you can do is you can do vol of vol. And that's like, uh, people try to do that too, because uh, apparently there's some recent literature which tells you uh, that this is a kind of a source of risk which is orthogonal to the volatility risk itself, okay? And what I'm talking about really is uh, this coffee, if you look at the volatility dynamics, volatility is also has this Brownian shocks here, and basically volatility of volatility will be this piece. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's volatility of volatility. So if I have high frequency now option data, I can do, or I can try to do what people have done estimating realized volatility, right? I mean, that's, that's essentially in a nutshell here, except that what I'll be plugging is not the true volatility, but some kind of a noisy proxy for that. So um, I'll, not, I'll not tell you much about this, you know, or rather I will not go in much detail about this, uh, just say that, okay, so and now here you will have to have high frequency option data, which we do. Um, and then and then you just look at the increments of volatility, uh, increments of volatility, okay? And then you square them, and that's it. Uh, the only thing, that, that will be the natural estimator, but the only thing which complicates matters here is the fact that what I really have is a noisy proxy of the true volatility and not the true one. Bottom line, there is an epsilon here, okay? And so what you need to do is you need to effectively bias correct or, or just remove that effect from the volatility. And so the way to do it is just to estimate the first order autocovariance of your est of the, of the volatility increments. And then they give you an, an estimator of the noise squared or the negative of the noise squared. And then your final estimator basically becomes this. It's just the squared returns of the volatility plus two times the, uh, the, auto the first order auto covariance. That's assuming that, um, 
the noise in the option data is not autocorrelated. Yoze. So if it was autocorrelated, we need to we need to do something else. We need to basically continue with more autocorrelations to undo that kind of uh, uh, to undo that kind of thing. So um, yeah, and so you can do this. Uh, if you do it on the data, this is what you get. Uh, so this is so a more recent thing from 2016 till till as far as option metric goes, uh, which is 2021. Okay. Um, and this, what you see here is a vol of vol. Here, by the way, doing the bias correction makes a hell of a difference. This is if I use just the original estimator with the shortest maturity, and if I bias correct for the mean reversions, this is what you get. Basically, you get a much higher volatility of volatility. Why? Because this bias, basically the mean reversion effects, they kind of smooth out the estimator and you have less volatility of volatility. Okay, and it blows up. Um, if you know of um, if you know of the Vivix, have you heard of the Vivix, the volatility of the Vix index and things like that? You might wonder how is that related to that? Well, it's very related to that, except that the, that's the volatility of the risk neutral one month Vix index. And what you will get if you do, if you calculate it here, I didn't plot it here because it's ten times smaller. Why is it ten times smaller? Because Vix is a one month conditional expectation. So you're smoothing so much that basically this becomes like 10 times smaller. At the beginning I said, uh, you gotta be kidding me, you know, like uh, uh, this, this is probably not reasonable. Um, and this might still not be reasonable, but then I, within the simulation I did with my model, you had that effect 10 to one, basically. In the, within the model, VIX, volatility of VIX versus volatility of spot volatility. So, so it was a real, it seems like it's a real, it's a real effect, but it's really like 10 times larger, basically. Yeah, then I actually wasn't that the point of the, the, this paper that I was like Ivan Sholiastovich and these guys that they were saying that volavol is actually very weakly related to volatility. That was, I thought that that was their conclusion. The, the, the reasons they were writing this equilibrium models kind of just to explain why is that correlation so weak. And so what you are saying is that, yeah, with the VIX, with the VIX. So, so what you are saying, I have to go back and check really, but, but I thought that's what I was using as some of the motivation that basically VIX, there's evidence that volatility of volatility is a separate source of risk, essentially what they were saying. So this, it's, it's very low, especially in this period, 2017, which is volatility was very low and look at this action, yeah, going on, yeah. Uh, yeah, striking and somewhat unbelievable, right? <laughs> so somehow something, yeah. No, no, well, well, when you see spikes like that, you might be really worried about things happening. Uh, that's why I restricted myself from 2016 on, so I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, look at this kind of spikes and then dropping down. I, I agree, I agree. Um, but uh, so. Maybe there are scope for further improvement, although I, I don't, I mean, volatility doesn't look crazy, but of course, when you're looking, this is, you're looking at increments of volatility. So even small kind of things can matter a lot for, for this type of estimators, but uh, yeah. So, double check. Yes, yeah, it is. So yeah, so the VIX is giving you some, but the, the point is that the VIX is giving you something very different because, because of, uh, of all of this mean reversion, you're really getting a, a series which is by, by design much, much smoother. And so you should get something which is very different. Okay. Now, I don't wanna torture you more with that, uh, but you know, but there are a lot more to be done with these things and in particular with applications. I think I had like little applications here and there without actually really kind of showing the, the beauty of this. Um, one comment on that question that you asked me though, uh, what happens around events? Around events, this basically, so around events, when there's a, essentially there's an extra term here Okay, 
around events, there is an extra term which is these jumps, these event jumps, because they are not, they don't have this intensity which is proportional to time. And if I'm looking, zooming in a, over very, very short intervals of time around the event, they dominate. Okay? And so if you want to recover then, if your still interest is to recover the volatility around the event, what you have to do is you have to use two maturities which bracket the event, take the ratio of the two, and then they will knock out the event and you will be left with the volatility. Otherwise, if you do what you're doing here, some of the volatility which you will recover will be part of due to the event. It's not as much as the total, it's not as much as the VIX, but nevertheless, it will be still polluted. Yeah. Yeah. Or oh, upward jump, because, uh, uh, yeah, okay. So now that's another good question. And if you doubt that, you can design a test for that. And that's what I did actually in one of my recent papers now. Uh, basically, what we were interested in is, is, is there a volatility jump at the, um, at the earning announcements for individual stocks? Because, and uh, so it's not, so it's funny that you are saying that downward jump, I, was, I would have guessed an upward jump because usually uh, when Tesla announces and then it takes a while for the market to calm down, right? But, uh, but sometimes it's uh, also, it depends on the type of announcement. Sometimes it's a resolution of uncertainty, yeah. And uh, the answer was that, yeah, th there is a little bit of volatility jump, which is priced in, but it's not as big as one would have guessed. It's not that big, but there is some, for some stocks, for some stocks which are really the influential ones, yes, you can see some of that showing up, yeah. So, thank you for asking these questions because that shows that there's a lot more to be done, so. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, Chris? No, 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 go ahead. Yeah. So, what we did after the break is estimate what the community calls for looking at the four days of action. What if I took my traditional classic model and I don't estimate there and I did it with four days of options and I did the difference between that and what we did after the break? Yeah. Implicitly, how is that related to what we did before the break? Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question too. So basically, now it's funny that it's good that you mentioned um, Bakshi, Madan Kapadia, estimator. I because I call this thing here. Remember when I come here, and I called this point here the VIX. Actually, it's not the VIX, but it's the Bakshi, Madan Kapadia estimator. They're they're slightly different, but they're almost the same thing. Yeah. So that's basically this. And so if I so so. When I do this and I subtract the spot volatility, then you're getting the, the, the jump variance, right? Now, the jump variance, so what I did before the break, I, I gave you the whole distribution, not just the second. So that will be just the second moment. So if you're interested in the second moment, then that's it, basically. You just stay with that. And, and then basically the second moment of the jumps. And yeah, that's right. That's right. That's a, that's, so in fact, that basically is, sorry for this flipping around, but that's, the, uh, it's, it's good that you, you're, you're connecting the things, but this is exactly what this JV is. That's what that thing is. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Thank you. Thank you.